Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final round of the HAPS grant interview process. I'm Dr. Joshua Bowen, and here at Digital Hammurabi, my wife Megan Lewis and I started perhaps the first ever crowdfunded research grant entitled HAPS, Humans Against Poor Scholarship. There is a great deal of poor scholarship here on YouTube, in social media, and really in our day-to-day -day interactions with others. Our goal in establishing this scholarship was twofold. First, we wanted to make it easier for PhD students to do new and exciting research, producing good scholarship. However, that new and exciting research often remains out of reach to normal everyday people. This brings us to our second goal, to make this new scholarship not only available to everyone, but to do so in a way that is understandable. To this end, each of our applicants are asked to give a, a live interview where they will pitch, essentially, their proposed research project to you, the audience, who will then vote, starting today, by the way, on the projects that you want to see funded. We've been fundraising since August of 2018, when we hope to reach $2,000 to fund one PhD student's summer research project. However, Viewers have been so generous that to date, we have raised, the new number, is $4,515.51. I hope that's updated, I think it is. Via Patreon and one-time PayPal donations. Now, we've already exceeded the $4,000 mark, and as long as our Patreon pledges do not decrease substantially, we will have received just over $6,000 by June. Having said that, we've lost $114 in monthly donations since the beginning of March which means that while we can securely fund two students, the chances of funding a third are not looking as healthy as they were in February. If you would like to see us fund three students and can spare any amount, then please consider sending a donation to our PayPal account or joining our Patreon. Links to both are in the description below. However many students we are able to fund, uh, sorry, yes. However many students we are able to fund, it's all down to you, our viewers. Thank you. Anyone who contributes gets a say in how the money is used. After today's interviews, today, donors will have the opportunity to vote for the scholar whose research they find that they find most appealing. Now, we've had a total of 17 applicants, which was an amazing response. Three have since removed their applications, leaving us with 14 applicants to interview. All of the interview dates, which of course end today, <clears throat> can be found on our website, digitalhammurabi.com forward slash calendar. Interviews will follow this format, if you haven't been following along. 10 minutes for the applicants to introduce themselves and pitch their project, 10 minutes for discussion, and then 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So if you are watching live and you have questions, get them in now. Please put them in the chat and tag at uh, Digital Hammurabi to make sure that we see them. In order to make sure all applicants are treated equally, we will be very strict about timings. So please get your questions in early to make sure that we get them. All right, our last round today, we're interviewing Miriam Bueno. I'm gonna hopefully get all these names right. Um, Helene Malloyne, Ryan Fitzgerald, and Priscilla Scoville. First up is Miriam, an art history student from the Universidad Nacional de Educación uh, then Helene, a history student from the University of College London, then Ryan, who is a religious studies student from the University of Texas at Austin, and then fourth is Priscilla, who is a history student from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. All right, that was my intro. And about two thirds of the way through it, I went, I did click the go live button, right? And I did, so that makes me feel better about being me. All right, so I've got Miriam here in the Hangout, so I'm going to click Show in Broadcast. And there she is. Miriam, if you unmute. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can. Perfect. Welcome. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Good, good. Well, um, I always <clears throat> think that that intro was going to take 10 minutes. And it never takes 10 minutes. So um, what we'll do is uh, if, if you want to take um, 
the next 10 minutes, what, what we'll do is we'll, instead of ending at uh, 1230, we'll end at 1225 just so that everybody stays consistent and you don't have to come up with five extra minutes of things to say because I know this is not easy. By the way, I told somebody about this uh, yesterday and they said, oh my goodness, how do they come on for a half an hour and talk? And I said, well, I'm just so welcoming and amazing. And they, they didn't buy that. So, um, but hopefully this will, hopefully this will work out. So, uh, Mary, why don't you take 10 minutes and just kind of introduce yourself, uh, let everybody uh, kind of get a chance to, to learn about who you are and then talk about your research and, um, and then what you want to do for your summer research project and then how you'll use the money if you win. Okay. So here I go. Hello, my name is Miriam. I'm from Spain and I'm an art historian. I, currently, I am in my second year of the research for my PhD, focused on dance scenes from the Egyptian New Kingdom at the UNED, Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Spain. New Kingdom is a period of time between the 16th century BC and the 11th century BC covering three dynasties from the 18th to the 20th. It is a period that starts with the reunification of the country thanks to Amose after the invasion of the Hyksos. With the Tutmosis pharaohs, Egypt leaves a moment of territorial expansion and prosperity and the contact with foreign people increases. Then came the Amarna period with the reign of Akhenaten who imposes a new art style and a complete new religious system with the prominence of the solar disk atom. The 19th and 20th dynasties are those called Ramesid, and with the last one starts the decline of the Egyptian empire until the power is divided between the pharaoh and the priest of Amun. With the important prosperity and stability that Egypt lives in this period, Egyptian painting and relief develop in both temples and tombs and reflects many aspects of the society, for, the same, for example, the contact with other empires. And in these tombs and temples, we can find dance scenes that illustrate the funerary and religious beliefs of the Egyptians, as well as the fashion or some cultural and social characteristics. Through the study of dance scenes in private tombs, we can learn about how they helped the, to the rebirth of the deceased in the afterlife with banquet scenes full of symbolism where we find dance scenes, or his entrance in the necropolis or in the underworld with the male dancers called Mu. But we can see too how dance and music was important in everyday life represented overall in the private tombs from the Amarna period and in the temples where we can see representation of different festivals. But as I said before, the study of this representation give us information too about the contact with other empires because we can see, for example, how the Egyptians adapted some instruments that came from other parts of the world, such as the angular harp, the square drum, the lute and the flute that appear in this period and came from Asia, some of them from Mesopotamia. I got into this research after writing my master thesis about the representation of dance in the paintings of the Theban tombs dated from the New Kingdom. Then I realized how important was this topic in the Egyptian decoration and that there were many studies about it. And that's why I expanded the research for my PhD to temples and to other places, not only Thebes. Besides, it allows me to get two of my patients together, Egyptian art and dance. I have danced for many years and it has helped me to understand that it is not only a physical activity, but it's a way of communication. While I was studying my degree, I saw a couple of dances scenes painted during the New Kingdom in, Eg in Egypt and decided to see how far I could go with that, with that topic. After a few years, I know there is still a lot of work to do, starting with the compilation of all the representations. That is something that no one has done yet. 
So my research pretends to be a reference work for future studies on the topic. But this compilation is not easy because the scenes are dispersed in many publications and even some of them are not published anywhere. And the copies are kept in, the, in museum archives, such as the one of the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Penn Museum. So that's where this scholarship could help me to allow me to go to these museums and enter in the archives to see the, the scenes and include them in, the, in my project because they are not available anywhere, anywhere else. So the complete compilation of all the scenes will make my study much, much more accurate overall when I compare the scenes and study the dissemination of them, because I'm trying to see if there is a social or a geographical pattern uh, in the representations of dance. Apart from that, I own a blog in Spanish focused on art in an history and that will help me to disseminate the results of my research and the publications or collaborations related to my project so the topic will be much well known than it is now well very good um excellent excellent uh, sorry uh <clears throat> i uh, i usually uh and no that was great that was really great. Uh, Thank you. I'm a little I'm a little nervous here because uh, as much as I've uh, wanted to study art history, um, at least more than I have, uh, I always feel a little nervous talking about art history because I I just uh, I feel like I and of course it's in Egypt, which means it's even further afield. Um, but <clears throat> maybe you could talk for just a couple of minutes. Uh, you say you're in your second year of your PhD. I think it would be um, nice to, can you, and, and you said that you dance and that that's, you know, that's helped with uh, the overall study. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on like what got you interested in Egyptology um, and just in general, because I know that, you know, a lot of people get interested in Egyptology for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, some people it's because of ancient aliens which of course I'm sure that you know are true and you could speak about that at length. I'm, I'm obviously kidding for all of our fans watching. Um, and also, uh, you know, the period that you're working in, um, you know, Marion Feldman has uh, written, uh, I'm sure as you know, a, a book that was several years ago now, I probably, probably almost five or six years ago now uh, on that internet, maybe it was longer than that, on that international style um, and uh, looking at Ugarit and, you know, seeing the different motifs, um, you know, maybe we could talk about that a little bit, but uh, yeah, if, sorry, I'm rambling a bit. Could you maybe, maybe just talk about, um, what, what brought you into Egyptology, um, yeah, but really in the first place, why get a PhD in it? I, I have loved Egyptian art since I was a child. I don't remember when was the first time I saw something related to Egyptian art. And I said, I want to do something related to it. And I read everything that mm, I could about it. And then I studied art history without knowing I was going to end to end in a study in Egyptian art. But when in the last year of my degree, I had to, to choose a topic and it was the paintings from the temple of Deir el-Bahari, Hatshepsut temple. And, and then I, con I saw the dances and scenes inside that temple. And then I did my master thesis and now my PhD because of that. Oh, that's fantastic. How long is, um, how long is your program on average? It's three years I have to do. I mean, the second one. Okay. And then you have... Uh, do you have a certain number of years that you can uh, write your dissertation or? I have written part of it already. Oh, wow. Because I'm, I'm not leaving all the writing for the end, for the last year. So I have studied overall the tombs and I have the temples left for the last year. But 
So the whole, so by the end of next year, you'll have essentially written your dissertation. Is that, is that, yep. wow. So it's interesting, of course, over here, um, we have, uh, at Hopkins at least, uh, we have three years of coursework and then you take your comprehensive exams and then you, you know, students will normally take four to six years after that to write their dissertation. So it, it, it's quite a lengthy process. Um, and uh, so it's, it's really neat to hear that you'd be, you'd be able to get, you know, done and get out in the field. Um, sorry, Megan just texted me. Uh, she, she's texting me questions because see, she's, uh, she's much more into art history than I am. And so she's texting questions that she wants to know. So I'm going to, I'm just going to read a couple of hers. Um, what kinds of people were buried in these tombs? It's the, from the um, people um, that belong to the, to the elite, to the um, bureaucracy in, in New Kingdom. No royal tombs. There are no dance in royal tombs. Just uh, the important people uh, that was near the, the king. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the first time that I started studying the royal tombs at Orr. And uh, yeah, that's, it's always very difficult, I think, to get at um, you know, what's actually going on uh, in, in mortuary complexes and you know, mortuary areas. So yeah, it sounds like it's, like it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so Megan asks, are dance scenes found widely on all kinds of tombs? What does she mean by all kinds of tombs? I don't know. That is a good question. And I'm sure that she will text me in the next 10 or 15 seconds and let me know. Um, while we're waiting, I think uh, we've got a, actually several questions uh, coming in from the chat. Um, so I'll just I'll ask a couple of those. So you might not be able to answer this. Um, but does it seem as though these scenes show the same dance or ritual, or are they very different? They are very different. Okay. You want to talk about yeah. that a little bit? It, yeah. In, in, in the private tombs, for, for example, that is the part I have studied the most, there are um, female uh, dancing scenes uh, that um, just move sometimes a leg, you see the movement only in, in a leg. And then in the funerary dances, you see the men in a um, position moving one arm and one leg. So it's not really similar. The contexts are totally different. The person who dances is totally different because some are just female and some are just men. And for example, in the, in the temples, they are acrobats. They are like doing a pivot. Wow. So it's totally different, the representation of, of that. And in the banquet scenes I mentioned, you find uh, that there are many instruments with the, with the dancers. But in the funerary ones, you see there is no instrument at all. Oh, wow. It's just the dancer. So it has to be different in any way. That is really cool. Uh, and Megan sent a, uh, a clarification. She says all kinds of tombs, meaning men, women, all positions um, uh, of the bureaucracy. Yeah, uh, all positions, yes. I am trying to see if there is a pattern uh, in the profession they had or, or some of the title they have, but I haven't found anything about it that could relate it to a special a kind of maybe re a, a religious title or a, no, I haven't found that. And in New Kingdom, they are all, overall um, male tombs because the, the female were buried with the husband or the nearest man of the family. So the titular, the owner of the tomb is a male. Oh. Okay. Um, oops. let's see. You mentioned that the scenes play a part in the rebirth of the buried individual. 
Can you talk a little about what effect they may have, uh, what effect they may have been thought to have? Did I say that right? Let me say it again. You mentioned that the scenes play part uh, play a part in the rebirth of the buried individual. Can you talk a little about what effect they may have been thought to have? There we go. Yeah, they are banquet scenes. So in a way, they are trying to um, entertain the people on the, of the banquet, but they are not real banquet as, as the, the disease is on it. So it's a, the music and the dance was a way of making the communication between the dead and the alive easier. So they could communicate both worlds and then get it easier to, to move from one world to another. Okay. Very good. Um, okay, so intellectual iconoclasm asks, please ask about dance and medicine from fertility and birth death to depression or digestive issues. With the banquet scenes, it has a, a, a link with the fertility because it's the rebirth of the disease. So everything related to, to fertility, to rebirth, to go again to our world and communicate with the, with the underworld, it's all related. But I don't know about medicine if it has an, a relation, a link or something. Hmm. So. Okay, yeah, it's a... Uh... Uh, medicine in the ancient world is uh, it's a, it's a tough thing and specialization, that's for sure. Um, intellectual iconoclasm again. He asks, my lovely wife asks if she has information about dance and the acoustic healing resonance rooms. No. I, I have studied that uh, there... They don't know, we, we don't know exactly where the music was played when there was dance. Some uh, scenes appear to be inside the inside a temple, inside a palace, but in, inside a room, and some um, are performed outside. But there is no information about it, or I haven't found it yet. What is, uh, can you just talk about, do you, do you know what the resonance room is, the healing resonance room? Because I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I understood, understood. Um, it's funny because um, part of our, part of our uh, history cycle was, you know, you took a year of Mesopotamian history and then you took a year of um, Palestine, uh, <clears throat> Palestinian uh, I can't remember what they actually called it, but you know, history of of uh, that part of the Levant, and then a year of uh, Egyptian history. And I remember, I, I just I had so little background in Egyptian history, and I was you know fascinated by it, but uh, it, it didn't because uh, because we don't run into it all the time. Uh, at least I don't, as a linguist, I don't run into it all the time. It's uh, it's fun to come back to it, but I always feel like I, I don't have the depth that I need to have in order to really engage about it. Well, I need to read more about it. That's just the bottom line, I guess. Um, let's see. Um, intellectual iconoclasm again. Has dance art been found in any of the tombs of sacred animals? No, I haven't found anything. Okay. You know, what was it? Was it the, um, there was a small, small animal that was buried in a, in a jar. And was, I think it was late, actually, um, in Egyptian history, uh, like late first millennium. But it said one, there was a, I think there was a priest. Boy, I'm really getting this, getting this bad, but just pulling it from my memory here. Um, one pot, one, but it might have been a monkey. Do, do, does that ring any bells? Like one pot, there was a, it was a, a rule, like one pot, one monkey. And uh, because they were putting more than one monkey 
in the pot. Um, Dr. Jazz now was talking about it, and I can't remember now. And now everybody's probably looking at their screen going, <laughs> what's he talking about? Josh, just ask the questions that the audience asks. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, Vibrantly Brantley asks, has Miriam studied any tools made in creating artworks like pounding stones for pigments, paint brushes, or chisels? I have read a little bit of, of them because it's useful to see, for example, uh, in in the female and, and samples when you see uh, that there is a woman playing a lute and a woman playing a harp and between them there is a girl just dancing. Uh, sometimes that girl is has a darker color and sometimes it is because of the pigments I mean, it's not something that the artist did, but maybe the, the pigments applied to the painting has changed over the time. So you have to study some things like that to see if the changes are original or they have happened after they painted the, the scene. Okay, interesting. Um. Mark Robbins, he asks, uh, are there any warlike dances seen in your research? Any what? Warlike, um, like a battle, I guess battle scenes. I have found just in Theban tombs, I have found just like one that is probably a military dance because they have a drum, which is an instrument that doesn't appear in any, in any other kind of scenes. So just one, and I don't know if I will find more. Interesting. Well, that's cool. Um, Megan asks, uh, what other kinds of scenes are there on tomb decorations? And are there a lot of differences between private and royal scenes? Royal uh, scenes, and I mean, dance scenes in royal tombs, there, are, and there aren't any. I have found dance inside royal tombs. Apart from that, I, there are uh, in private tombs, in Thebes, there are uh, dances inside banquet scenes, which are really similar between them. Sometimes there are copies of the same uh, scene in different tombs. In funerary context, I have found the more dancers, which are like two or three types of dancers, but they are really similar and the meaning is so similar. And then um, I have found other scenes that you cannot uh, make big groups of them because just one, two scenes are similar. And I have found like a monkey dancing, um, acrobats like, like in temples, and a lot of uh, female musicians dancing and the military one I told before. And in Amarna, all are related to, to festivals. They are complete, completely different from the uh, Thiban one. They are related to festivals. And in El Cap, I have found the same kind of scenes as in Thieves. Cool. It's interesting when you get into research and you, you start actually bringing all the data together. Uh, I know I did this, um, I had this huge Excel spreadsheet and I, I wrote on um, lamentational liturgies in Sumerian and um, from the early second millennium. And I remember after putting, you know, 4,000 4, entries in the, all these different texts, um, you know, starting to sort them into these categories and to see the patterns. And that's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a very elucidating and exciting moment because you start to see, oh, you know, uh, yeah. if we look at this diachronically, we can see that, you know, these changes take place. If we look in the north, we can see these things are happening, whereas in the south, these things. So it's, uh, you know, for those of you out there that, um, you know, wonder if, if doing research can be exciting. Yes. Yes, it can. And those are the moments when you start to see those patterns. So. Very good. I started with 50 scenes 
Now I have like a hundred. Wow. And it's like, let's make groups because if I don't make the groups, I, I will get crazy yep. among these pictures. So yeah, it's the it same thing. It's really interesting because, you know, Megan, Megan is writing on um, royal inscriptions from the uh, third and second millennia. And um, it's, it's interesting because it's not only about creating categories, um, but it's by, it's also about looking at how other people in the past have categorized these things. So she's, you know, she's collected all these royal inscriptions and people like William Hallow have gone through and categorized them in certain ways. And what she's doing is reevaluating that classification system and saying, you know, is this really, is this the best way that we should look at this? And I suspect that, you know, um, if no one has done this before, as you said, you know, what's, what's neat about it is you'll sort of get the ball rolling with your dissertation, with your project, with your book. And then, you know, maybe, you know, 10 years from now, somebody will come along and they'll say, boy, they're going to stand on your shoulders and they're going to, you know, take your your classification system and maybe develop it a little bit. So, you know, for those of you watching, um, it's um, this the research at this level is actually it can be really exciting because, you know, sometimes you come up with a completely new idea, something that nobody's thought of, and then sometimes you're reevaluating other people's ideas and and coming up with an even more uh, precise way to think about. Um, you know the things that they've that they've thought of. So it's it's a lot of fun. It could be a lot of fun. Um, all right, I, we've got a couple more questions, and then we'll, uh, I think we I think we got time maybe for one more. Let's see. Um, so uh, Boobska the second asks, I am well aware that this is a silly question. The modern dance walk like an Egyptian uses a sort of ridiculous Egyptian pose. And uh, I think I think I might remember it. It's this this one, and then and then that one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've never seen that pose in Egyptian art. Do you know if it's based on anything? That's a really good question. That's not silly. That's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. I haven't found anything like that in New Kingdom. I, I don't know about other periods, but not in the New Kingdom. But you know what? On the cover of your book, when you publish your dissertation, that's what you should do. You should be on it, and you should be. You're like, <laughs> I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Probably it's probably probably not a good idea. Well, at least don't do that when you defend. You know, <laughs> walk in the room like this. Um, that is uh, that's funny. Oh my gosh. Well, Miriam, this has been great. Um, we started about five minutes early, so um, I'll let you get out of here five minutes early. But why don't you take the last, you know, two minutes and just sort of, you know, maybe bring it all together, sum it all up and say, um, here's why my project is really important. And here's why you should vote for me, because they're going to start voting today. So, you know, really uh, I feel like Ryan Seacrest here. That's what I feel like. All right, Miriam, go ahead and give a, a real good pitch, you know. Uh, sorry, I don't know if everybody watches American Idol, but sorry, but go ahead. Okay, thank you. So now my pro I have explained my, pro my project already, and the most important part of it is the, the possibility of getting all the images, the scenes I, I can to make it the most complete possible, to make it the most accurate uh, possible, and get a real conclusion of of it all because if i only have a part of the of the scenes then the conclusions won't won't be complete and then things can change having like 20 30 pictures more than i have now so that's why i need the scholarship <laughs> excellent excellent it's really important i mean there's no doubt about it for everybody watching you know if you you know if you if you have a data set and you draw a conclusion um without having all of the the data set available it, it can it can be very very difficult um you know to make uh, to make good conclusions so well, excellent well marion thank you so much for coming and uh thank you for dealing with my um inadequacies here in uh in knowing about egyptian uh, egyptian <laughs> art so uh, this has been great but uh we will hopefully be talking to you again soon okay thank you all so right. much all right take care
Night. Bye. Okay. So uh, next we have that was fun. That was fun. Uh, next we have Helene, and Helene, I'm gonna un, or I'm gonna broadcast you. If I can figure out where that is, show and broadcast. Beautiful. And uh, Helene, if you want to unmute, you yep. there? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, do I need to unmute you? Because I can see you, but I can't hear you. I uh, can hear you. Uh, can you guys hear in the audience? I can't hear. Um, let me try present. No, that wouldn't do it. I'm going to mute you and then unmute you, and maybe that'll... Wait a minute. We can hear honey, but I think you've locked the screen. Oh, I have locked the screen. So we can just see you. Is uh, it working? Well, I don't know what that means. Okay. So Helene, I tell you what, Helene, can you uh yeah. maybe go out and come back in? Um okay. and let's just see if that fixes it, because I gotta be able to hear you. All right. Sorry. Uh this is all my fault. I'm sure somehow, uh, but Megan has said that uh, that you guys can hear, so that's great. Okay, so I will now try to broadcast again. How's that? Nothing. Oh, all right, Megan, you may have to come help me. Um, because I've I've exhausted uh, all that? possibilities now of what to do. And I hear Megan's footsteps coming toward me. Sorry, everyone. I, I, I'm quite certain that this is my fault. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do. Hi, Helene. Hello, everybody. There we go. Uh, why can't you hear? Because I can hear. Sorry, everyone, there must be something with our speakers. But I just I haven't done anything since the Miriam. Left. No, I know. Because I can hear, Eileen, I can hear you absolutely fine in the living room. Um, but we can't hear out here. Oh, no, this is. Well, maybe what we'll do is. <laughs> is that working now? Maybe you, Eileen, maybe we'll, you just talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Oh. Okay. You're inviting yourself. I am. Oh, oh, I see. Ah, so, right. So maybe what we're going to have to do here, and I'm really sorry, um, is Megan will come in and maybe she'll be able to hear you. And then we'll do a third party interview. Well, I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and just take, go ahead and take 10 minutes and because they can hear you out there and just go ahead and um, tell everybody about yourself and your project. And, uh, and then we'll get rolling uh, somehow. Hopefully we'll have it figured out by then. Okay, that's great. Yeah, um, I guess <laughs> um, everyone can hear me. That's great. Uh, thank you, Josh and uh, Digital Hammurabi and everyone for having me. Let me talk about my project. And um, so my name is Helen, and I'm an archaeologist, a historian and a curator, and I'm interested in the history of archaeology as a discipline and sort of how we as archaeologists communicate with the public and successfully doing so, I believe, and that is what my PhD thesis is about, makes us better archaeologists. So I studied University College London in the history department. I'm in my fourth year, and that means I'm in the writing up period. That means I've written about two thirds of my PhD by now. So my work looks at the time between the wars, that is to say between 1918 and 1939, uh, when, for example, Leonard Woolley was excavating in Ur, Howard Carter found the tomb of Tutankhamun, and um, John Marshall was excavating the Indus Valley. And so this is often called the golden age of archaeology because of these big and very important discoveries. But perhaps uh, viewers in America are maybe more familiar with people like James Henry Breasted, who founded the Oriental Institute in Chicago, or um, Edward Kiera, who was a philologist and archaeologist, and they were also active during that period. So now we'll connect some of these names and why they will remember today. A reader. This period was a formative time for archaeology, especially in Britain, and that is uh, the area I focus on, because the university institutes were being founded and archaeologists became uh, professionals, so to speak, so that is, you could now take up archaeology as a career and study it without having to rely on private income. 
and very importantly also more and more women were becoming archaeologists. So this is the intersection that interests me um, in my work, the popular and the professional side of archaeology. So how have these two sides of a career influenced each other and consequently the course of archaeology as a discipline? And what I do in my thesis is I look at this by looking at books written by archaeologists specifically aimed at a general reader, newspaper and magazine articles authored by archaeologists um, and how they communicated with listeners on the radio, specifically on the BBC. So in fact, so what I'm interested in is our forefathers. My screen has come blank, so I have no idea whether I'm still live or not, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, I'm looking at uh, a pre-digital Hammurabi, is what I wanted to say. And so my background, I studied uh, archaeology of the ancient Near East back home in Switzerland. And then I moved to London to study museum studies, because actually I wanted to uh, share what I love and find fascinating about ancient communities uh, with other people. So at the same time, I started working on an excavation in Turkey uh, at a place called Terracana. And this is the location of the ancient city of Alalakh, which was occupied during the Bronze and early Iron Ages. So that is to say between 2000 and 1000 BC. And so the archaeologists among you, please don't get into a fight with me about chronology. This is just a, a very general uh, date I'm giving. So the site is in southern Turkey, close to the southern border. Uh, so if you know where ancient uh, Antioch is, we're about 15 miles uh, from there, um, or about 60 miles, or about 100 kilometers from Morocco in Syria. And uh, Allah was a very important city in the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. It's located on the River Orontes, which uh, runs from modern day Lebanon through Syria and into Turkey and then um, into the Mediterranean Sea. And so this proximity to the rivers, uh, the sea and major trade routes connecting the city to Anatolia, northern Mesopotamia and Syria made um, Alalakh into a major trading hub. Uh, we have consequently, so we have many objects found from uh, places like Cyprus, Anatolia and even Egypt. So people came to meet and exchange knowledge and goods at Alalakh. We're not the first team to dig there at Tachana. The site was first excavated by Leonard Woolley in the 30s and 40s but our current project has been running for over 15 years now. So now I joined this uh, great team in 2012 and we have people coming from all over, this, uh, all over the world, from the States, the UK, Italy, Germany and uh, many other countries. And we work with the Turkish academic and local communities. So my position on the team uh, is I'm the registrar. That means I'm in charge of registering all the objects we find. This includes things such as beads and tools, um, large architectural pieces like uh, column bases and uh, flints, anything that comes out of graves, figurines, cylinder seals, vessels, anything you like really. And our object materials, so our materials range from um, metal, ivory, bone, clay, glass, fire, stone, and occasionally, but only very occasionally, boots or even textile. And my job is to record these objects on our database. So I describe them, measure them, make a sketch, and then assign them a location in our storage depot. And some of the complete and more important pieces go to the local museum at the end of the season. And it is also my part, of, uh, part of my job to arrange this with the representative of the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism. So in fact, I talked to a whole host of specialists. We have archaeobotanists from local plant remains, bioarchaeologists who are interested in human remains, uh, zoo archaeologists, of course, look at animal bones, pottery specialists, conservators, um, uh, researchers who come to look at, for example, beads or metal tools or other types of objects and who visit us during the excavation season to see our finds. Of course, we also have lots of students, uh, undergraduates from various universities in Turkey and from around the world who come and learn about fieldwork methods with us. So you can actually now imagine Telachana um, as a place where people meet and exchange knowledge. And it's just like um, they did in the Bronze Age. So one reason why um, initiatives like this have scholarship is so important uh, is because um, archaeology is severely underfunded, as you surely know. So every archaeologist I've ever met considers their work very um, rewarding in itself. And all of us work for more hours than we paid for by our fellowships or by university jobs. But most of us, and that includes me, we don't get paid for working at Telachana not because our universities or the governments don't um, consider our work important, uh, but because there simply is no, no money to go around. 
And in addition, in my case, because the work I do, as I've explained, does not um, directly link to my PhD research, my university doesn't um, support me with funding. So um, if I were to receive your funding, it would make a very big difference uh, in my life to be able to pay for um, airfare, um, travel insurance, visa fees, and other expenses involved in traveling to Turkey. And as a student as well, this would make a, a great difference in my life. Now, um, we're also um, currently preparing um, one of our publications on the late Bronze Age levels. And of course, I'm very um, excited and honored to be part of that. But that might mean further expenses because I might have to become a researcher in turn and visit other um, sites, um, maybe visit the library to do some research. So also your contributions would help with that. Um, and I would very much appreciate uh, your vote. Now, um, I don't know what is happening because there's no image. I don't even know whether I'm still live or not. Um, I've kind of run out of um, things to say for now, but um, I can just talk about my PhD work perhaps, because that is um, what I do all the time. Okay, um, so I, I still can't hear anything. Um, and <laughs> sorry, uh, I. Um, Research sounds fascinating. Okay, Megan says your research sounds fascinating. Oh. Megan, why don't you try to come in the room? Um, yeah, I am really sorry. This is uh, this is very frustrating. Um, and <clears throat> sorry to oh, both Ryan and Priscilla. They were both here in the room with us. And um, sorry, this sounds really bad. I don't know a better way to say this. I had to eject them to see if there was a glitch. Because Ryan, when you came in, uh, it, you came in twice and you were in there twice sitting there. So if you guys want to, you can come back in. Um, and actually, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Megan has texted me some questions from the audience because of course I can't see those questions either. So I'm gonna ask you and okay. then I'll mute again. And uh, actually, you know what? Here's what I'll do. I'll put them in the side chat. Can you see the side chat? Um. Um, yeah. so I'll put them in the side chat. You can answer them and, okay. uh, because I won't know when you're, when you're done. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'll ask you the first one here. So vibrantly Brantley asks, um, was Indiana Jones an inspiration for you growing up? And if so, how common are snakes on excavations? Uh, well, I think every archaeologist who says that they don't like Indiana Jones, um, they are lying, because uh, all three, and I'm ignoring the fourth one, movies are really, really good. Um, so I, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to be an archaeologist. Uh, to be honest, that is always um, was always my goal in life, shall we say? It's really hard um, thing to achieve, I think, because as I said, there is no money around. Not everybody's as lucky as Indiana Jones to just find little things just lying around in a temple or fighting the Nazis. Um, why there are no snakes? Um, there are no snakes on our, well, there is actually, there are occasionally snakes on our excavation, but um, not a whole vat full of snakes. Um, I have never seen that. Um, I guess it's because they don't really like people that much. And they're, I think, probably more scared of us than we are of them. Again, if it's just one or one or one or two of us, uh, one or two of them, actually, should I say. Um, I see there's uh, some more questions from Sarah. Um, the most significant finds. Um, oh, that's a really, that's a really tough one. Um, we have, um, Everything is significant. It kind of depends on your on your perspective. Um, that is well. I personally really like the small finds that we that we um, get. I like beads. Anything that is made out of files or glass or anything like that. Picture is gone again. No Josh. So I'm just going to keep talking. Um, other people really like pottery. So I think pottery is really important because it helps us date create a sequence of dates. And I think that is probably, despite it sounding perhaps really boring, one of the most significant things that we find. I have another question. What do you think about physical excavation techniques versus developing electronic scan? Um, um, 
I'm not quite sure what you mean by electronic scanning. Do you mean ground penetrating um, equipment? Um, if so, I think always, I mean, physical excavation techniques um, are always going to be very important simply um, because we also collect actually a lot of samples. So we collect a lot of soil samples. Um, we collect a lot of samples that are going through flotation. That means we're going to float them to find uh, plant remains that we can then analyze to look at what people ate, uh, the environment um, and things like that. And I'm not sure that you can really um, catch these kind of things with uh, electronic scanning. Um, do you have any more questions for me? Or I can talk about my research or more about snakes and chopping their heads off. That is what we do. Or I can talk about my research or um, more about snakes sorry. And chopping their heads off. That is what we do. Sorry, I've got you. This is so convoluted and i'm so sorry <laughs> i still can't hear you here but i brought you up live um <laughs> which of course there's like a 12 second delay um all right it's 12 41. um how do you how do you feel um <laughs> because okay so here's here's my concern my concern is that um uh, actually, I'm going to bring the next person in. Actually, let's do that. Ryan or Priscilla, if you're watching, would would one of you come back in or both of you come back in? Because here's the thing. If uh, if you come back in, by the way, Megan is feverishly trying to restart her computer out there so that she can come into the Hangout and take over the interview. Um, but if one of you guys can come back in, then I'll check and see if... Um, I'll check and see if the it's the if it's my computer or if it's it can't be your computer. I don't I have no idea what's going on, frankly. Maybe we should just restart the hangout. I don't really know. Um, and there's a 10 second delay, so Megan won't hear what I'm saying for 10 seconds. So um, and I don't know what to ask you because I didn't hear anything that you said. <laughs> Oh, wait, I can look at the live chat. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Do you... i tell you what, we'll go ahead because this has been such a cluster for you. Um, we will go ahead and end it for you here. And what I'll do is uh, we'll we'll talk offline. And uh, after after these streams, and then um, if you'd like to come back on, and we'll do another, you know, another like ten or fifteen minutes. But I I feel like just the fact that you've been a champ through this, uh, and and sort of taken it on yourself to interview yourself, um, I think that says a lot. So um, thank you, thank you for your patience in this. Well, thank you for having me. So here's what we're gonna do, Ryan and Priscilla. If you can hear me, I'm going to shut this down. Everybody watching, give me about five minutes to redo this. And um, actually, it'll probably be Megan redoing it. And then she'll open up a new Hangout, and then we'll send out the link. <sighs> I'm really sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast here, and then we'll start it again in five minutes. Um, thank you so much. That's great. Thank you so much for your patience. Bye-bye. All, all right.